After enduring years of savagery and fighting in some of the most intense battles in history, the Americans embarked on their ultimate confrontation against the Japanese. The Japanese, resolute and unwilling to surrender, placed the onus on the Allies to compel them to give up. What unfolded in Okinawa proved to be one of the most harrowing chapters of the Pacific. The Battle of Okinawa, known by the codename Operation Iceberg, took place on the Ryukyu Islands of Okinawa and stands as the largest amphibious assault in the Pacific War of World War II. Spanning 82 days, the conflict unfolded from early April to mid-June 1945. Following an extensive island-hopping campaign, the Allies, in their approach towards Japan, strategized to utilize Okinawa, a sizable island situated a mere 340 miles 550 kilometers, away from mainland Japan. The plan was to establish it as a base for air operations in preparation for the impending invasion of the Japanese mainland, known as Operation Downfall. With the Japanese forces cornered on their home islands and a significant portion of their naval strength obliterated, the United States was poised for a decisive engagement in the Pacific theater. At the helm of this strategic undertaking was General Simon Buckner, a seasoned military leader tasked with orchestrating the intricate maneuvers required to conquer the island. The enormity of Operation Iceberg was reflected in the sheer scale of the American forces under General Buckner's command. Seven U.S. divisions, comprising a formidable contingent of approximately 180,000 troops, were mobilized for this crucial offensive. Their objective was clear, to secure Okinawa and destroy the Japanese Empire once and for all. On the opposing side, the Japanese defenders were resolute, with an estimated 120,000 soldiers entrenched on the island. As the American forces prepared for what promised to be one of the final, hard-fought battles in the Pacific, the stakes were high, and the outcome would undoubtedly shape the course of history, also known as the Final Battle. As the American forces made their initial push on Okinawa, the absence of substantial resistance seemed almost deceptive. The first five days unfolded with a calculated advance, as they swiftly secured key airfields and strategic positions across the small archipelago. Confidence among the troops grew, and the belief in an impending victory was near, and the island could be theirs without much of a fight. However, the tranquility that marked the initial stages of the assault on Okinawa was merely the calm before the storm. Unbeknownst to the American forces, the Japanese defenders were strategically holding their ground, reserving their strength for a determined and tenacious counteroffensive. While the 6th Marine Division was engaged in clearing the northern regions of Okinawa, the U.S. Army's 96th Infantry Division and 7th Infantry Division executed a strategic maneuver, heading southward through the narrow waste of the island. As the 96th Infantry Division advanced, they were met with intense resistance in the west-central part of Okinawa. Japanese forces, entrenched in fortified positions to the east of Highway No. 1 and approximately 5 miles kilometers, northwest of Shuri, particularly along Cactus Ridge, fiercely contested the American progress. Simultaneously, the 7th Infantry Division faced comparable challenges further south. The division encountered formidable Japanese opposition emanating from a rocky pinnacle situated about 1,000 yards southwest of Arakachi, later known as the Pinnacle. 
In both instances, these confrontations highlighted the tenacity of Japanese forces and the challenging terrain that American troops had to navigate in their campaign across Okinawa. As of the evening of April 8th, American forces successfully eliminated numerous heavily fortified positions, including the ones mentioned earlier. Despite achieving this significant progress, the cost was substantial, with over 1,500 battle casualties suffered by U.S. troops. In the course of these operations, approximately 4,500 Japanese soldiers were either killed or captured. However, the realization dawned that this phase marked just the beginning of a more extensive and formidable battle. It became evident that the conquered positions were not the main defensive line, but rather outposts protecting the more substantial Shuri line. This understanding underscored the ongoing challenges and the arduous nature of the campaign faced by the U.S. forces on Okinawa. The fighting here in Okinawa has been exceptionally harsh, and each day brings new challenges. The Japanese forces seem to emerge from the ground like snakes, making every step forward a hard-fought battle. The resilience and bravery of our fellow Marines are truly commendable. We are facing an enemy that is determined and resourceful, but I believe in the strength and training of our unit. The conditions are tough, and the island presents its own set of challenges. The landscape is unforgiving, but our camaraderie and dedication to the mission keep us going. The support from back home, like your letters and thoughts, serves as a source of motivation for all of us on the front lines. I want to express my gratitude for your support and encouragement. It means more to me than words can convey. Your letters are a lifeline, connecting me to the world beyond the chaos of battle. I often find myself reflecting on the values instilled in us as Marines. And it is those values that drive us to persevere through the toughest of times. While the fighting is intense, I hold on to the hope that this will all be over soon. Our collective efforts, sacrifice and determination will see us through. I dream of the day when I can return home and we can share stories of these challenging times in person. Facing a deadlock in the American assault on Kakazu Ridge, Japanese General Ushijima, under the influence of General Cho, opted to shift the dynamics by initiating an offensive strategy. On the evening of April 12th, the 32nd Army, commanded by Ushijima, launched a comprehensive attack on U.S. positions across the entire front. The Japanese assault proved to be intense, sustained, and well-coordinated. The Japanese were not giving up. Their motivation was at an all-time high to fight for their homeland. The American positions were getting hammered. Engaging in fierce close combat, the Japanese forces initially withdrew, only to resume their offensive the following night. A final assault on April 14th was once again met with resistance and repulsed by the American defenders. The repeated attacks prompted the 32nd Army's staff to analyze the situation, leading them to the conclusion that while the Americans were susceptible to night infiltration tactics, the overwhelming firepower at their disposal made any concentrated offensive actions by Japanese troops highly perilous. Consequently, the Japanese forces reverted to a defensive stance, recognizing the challenges posed by the superior firepower of the American troops. On April 19th, General Hodge initiated a fresh offensive marked by an unprecedented artillery barrage involving 324 guns, establishing a record for the Pacific Ocean Theater. The assault was not limited to ground forces. Battleships, cruisers, and destroyers joined in the bombardment. Subsequently, 650 Navy and Marine planes launched an aerial onslaught, employing napalm, rockets, bombs, and machine guns against enemy positions. Despite the overwhelming firepower unleashed by the Americans, the Japanese defenses were strategically positioned on reverse slopes. This allowed the defenders to endure the artillery barrage and aerial assault in relative safety within caves. Once the bombardment subsided, the Japanese emerged from their concealed positions to unleash mortar rounds and grenades upon the advancing American forces climbing the forward slope. This tactical maneuver showcased the resilience and adaptability of the Japanese defenders in the face of formidable firepower. An attempt to break through Kakazu Ridge via a tank assault, strategically designed to outflank the ridge, ended in failure as it failed to connect with its infantry support trying to cross the ridge. This endeavor resulted in the loss of 22 tanks. 
Despite the use of flame tanks effectively clearing numerous cave defenses, the operation did not achieve the desired breakthrough. The ex kexev Corps, responsible for this offensive, incurred significant casualties, with 720 men reported as killed, wounded, or missing in action. The extent of losses might have been more severe if not for the fact that the Japanese had committed a substantial portion of their infantry reserves to the south. This diversion was prompted by a feint orchestrated by the 2nd Marine Division off the Minnetoga beaches, coinciding with the tank assault on Kakazu Ridge. As April drew to a close, following the successful penetration of the Machinado defensive line by army forces, a restructuring of units took place. The 1st Marine Division assumed responsibility by relieving the 27th Infantry Division, while the 77th Infantry Division took over from the 7th. Additionally, with the arrival of the 6th Marine Division, the Thry Amphibious Corps assumed control of the right flank, and the overall command of the battle transitioned to the 10th Army. On May 4th, the 32nd Army, led by Ushijima, initiated another counteroffensive attempting amphibious assaults on the coasts behind American lines. In support, Japanese artillery moved into the open, firing 13,000 rounds, but effective U.S. counter-battery fire destroyed numerous Japanese artillery pieces, resulting in the failure of the attack. Subsequently, on May 11th, Buckner launched an American counter-attack that spanned 10 days of intense fighting. By May 13th, forces from the 96th Infantry Division and 763rd Tank Battalion successfully captured Conical Hill, a crucial eastern anchor of the main Japanese defenses. Simultaneously, the 6th Marine Division battled for Sugarloaf Hill, on the opposite coast. The capture of these key positions exposed the Japanese around Shuri on both flanks, as Buckner aimed to envelop Shuri and trap the main defending Japanese force. As May drew to a close, monsoon rains compounded the challenges, transforming contested hills and roads into impassable terrain. The ground advance began to resemble a World War I battlefield, with troops bogged down in mud and flooded roads hindering the evacuation of the wounded. Living in a field transformed into a mix of garbage dump and graveyard, the unburied Japanese and American bodies decayed, sinking into the mud and contributing to a noxious environment. The challenging conditions were further highlighted by the presence of maggots, making the journey perilous for anyone navigating the slippery slopes. I trust this letter finds you in good health and spirits. I wanted to take a moment to update you on the current situation here in Okinawa. The past few days have been exceptionally tough, with relentless attacks from the Japanese forces testing the metal of our defences. The enemy has been persistent in their assaults, smashing into our lines with determination. Despite the challenges, I am proud to report that we have been successful in repelling many of their attacks. Our unit has displayed incredible courage and resilience in the face of adversity, holding our ground and gaining control of a significant portion of the island. However, these victories have come at a heavy cost. We have lost many good men from our unit in the intense fighting. Each loss is deeply felt, and the camaraderie we shared makes their absence all the more poignant. These brave individuals made the ultimate sacrifice and their memory will forever be etched in our hearts. The landscape here is a stark reminder of the toll this conflict has taken on both sides. The challenges we face daily are immense, but the determination to secure the island and honor the sacrifices of our fallen comrades keeps us moving forward. On May 29th, Major General Pedro del Valle, commanding the 1st Marine Division, directed Company A, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, to capture Shuri Castle. The seizure of the castle held significant strategic and psychological importance for the Japanese and marked a pivotal moment in the campaign. General Delval's leadership in this endeavor and the subsequent occupation and reorganization of Okinawa earned him a Distinguished Service Medal. The battleship USS Mississippi had shelled Shuri Castle for three days prior to the assault, contributing to the withdrawal of the 32nd Army to the south. This facilitated the Marines in securing Shuri Castle, although it was beyond the 1st Marine Division's assigned zone. 
the timely efforts of the 77th Infantry Division prevented potential friendly fire casualties from an American airstrike and artillery bombardment. Despite facing artillery harassment, the Japanese executed a skillful retreat under the cover of night and aided by monsoon storms. The 32nd Army successfully moved nearly 30,000 men into its last defense line on the Kian Peninsula, resulting in significant casualties, including thousands of civilian deaths. In the latter stages of the Okinawa battle, the peninsula housed 9,000 IJN troops, supported by 1,100 militia, with $4,000 stationed at an underground headquarters overlooking the Okinawa naval base. On June 4, elements of the 6th Marine Division conducted an amphibious assault on the peninsula. All 4,000 Japanese sailors, including Admiral Minoru Ota, committed suicide within the hand-built tunnels of the underground naval headquarters on June 13. By June 17, the remnants of the 32nd Army, led by Ushijima, were confined to a small pocket in the far south of the island, southeast of Ituman. On the 18th of June, General Buckner met his demise under enemy artillery fire while overseeing the advancing front lines of his troops. This pivotal moment led to the appointment of Roy Geiger as his successor, marking a unique occurrence where Geiger became the sole U.S. Marine to take command of a numbered army within the U.S. Army during active combat. However, Geiger's tenure in this role was brief, lasting only five days before Joseph Stilwell assumed command. The conclusive turning point in the battle against Japanese forces transpired on the 21st of June, with the remaining pockets of Japanese resistance finally succumbing. It's worth noting that some Japanese individuals persisted in hiding, among them Masahide Ota, the future governor of Okinawa Prefecture. In a poignant conclusion to the conflict, Ushijima and Cho opted for the ancient ritual of seppuku, taking their own lives within their command headquarters situated on Hill 89 during the closing hours of the battle. Colonel Yahara, a notable figure in these dire circumstances, had sought Ushijima's permission to follow suit in ritual suicide. However, Ushijima denied the request, emphasizing the importance of preserving the truth about the Battle of Okinawa. If you perish, there will be no one left to bear witness to the reality of this battle. Endure the temporary shame. This is a direct order from your army commander. Yahara, the highest ranking officer to survive the conflict on the island, later penned a book titled, The Battle for Okinawa, providing a unique perspective on the events that unfolded. Okinawa has been taken, but not without an intense and grueling fight. The battle was unlike anything I've experienced before, and the toll it has taken on our forces has been significant. Despite our best efforts, we have lost a considerable number of brave men in the process. Each loss is deeply felt, and the weight of their sacrifice hangs heavy on our hearts. The fighting was relentless, and while the island is now under control, there are still small holdouts of resistance. These remaining pockets continue to put up a fight, showcasing the tenacity of those who refuse to surrender. The resolve of our forces remains strong as we work to bring the remaining hostilities to an end. On a personal note, my foot is in rough shape after the fighting. I'm pretty sure it's infected, the conditions were challenging, and it took a toll on many of us physically. Despite the injuries, I am grateful to be alive and to have played a part in securing Okinawa. The medical team here is providing the care needed and I am hopeful for a full recovery. The experience has been harrowing, but it has also reinforced the importance of the bonds forged between comrades. The memory of those we lost will forever be etched in our hearts and their sacrifice will not be forgotten. As American troops approached victory, local civilians were driven to mass suicide by Japanese soldiers who falsely claimed that victorious American forces would engage in widespread killing and rape. The Ryukyu Shimpo, a major Okinawan newspaper, reported in 2007 that many Okinawans testified to being directed by the Japanese army to take their own lives. Some even received grenades from Japanese soldiers for this purpose. Influenced by Japanese propaganda depicting U.S. soldiers as brutal aggressors committing atrocities, certain civilians chose to kill their families and themselves to avoid capture, often resorting to leaping off cliffs, including those near the present-day Peace Museum. Contrary to the warnings of the Japanese military, 
Okinawans were surprised by the relatively humane treatment they received from the advancing Americans. Mark Seldon's book, Islands of Discontent, Okinawan Responses to Japanese and American Power, highlights that the Americans did not adopt a policy of torturing, raping, or murdering civilians, as warned by Japanese military officials. Teruto Tsubota, a U.S. Marine and combat translator born in Hawaii, successfully persuaded hundreds of civilians not to take their own lives. Ninety percent of the structures on the island were obliterated, and numerous historical records, artifacts, and cultural treasures were lost, transforming the once tropical landscape into a desolate expanse of mud, lead, decay, and maggots. The strategic importance of Okinawa exceeded expectations, serving as a vital location for a fleet anchorage, troop staging areas, and airfields near Japan. Following the removal of mines in Operation Zebra, the U.S. occupied Okinawa, instituting the United States Civil Administration of the Ryukyu Islands as a form of military government. Substantial U.S. forces continued to be stationed there, with Kadena remaining the largest U.S. airbase in Asia. The cornerstone of Peace Memorial, erected by the Okinawa government in 1995 at Mabuni, the site of the final conflict in southeastern Okinawa, honors all individuals, both civilian and military, Japanese and foreign, who perished in the battle. Some military historians posit that the Okinawa campaign directly influenced the decision to deploy atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, aiming to avert the planned ground invasion of the Japanese mainland. An alternative perspective, as presented by Victor Davis Hansen in his book Ripples of Battle, suggests that the intense Japanese defense on Okinawa and the staggering casualties prompted American strategists to seek alternative methods for subduing mainland Japan. The advent of atomic bombs provided a means to convince the Japanese to seek unconditional peace without incurring American casualties. Ironically, Hansen notes that the conventional firebombing of major Japanese cities, ongoing before Okinawa, was more effective at civilian casualties than the atomic bombs. If the Americans had continued or expanded this strategy, the Japanese might have surrendered nonetheless. And with that, we conclude our video. The suffering endured by Japanese civilians during the war was truly horrific. War, in essence, is a harrowing experience. There are no winners, only continuous suffering for all sides involved. In the midst of war, there is no clear good side. It is a senseless cycle of violence driven by motives beyond the control of individual soldiers. We hope you have enjoyed this video and gained new insights. As always, we appreciate all the recent support on our videos. Remember to check out the links below for our Patreon and Instagram. Finally, we will catch you soon. Goodbye for now.